All right, Chaplain Dean Alley here. Wanted to share a little bit about a uh, message about uh, Abraham um, and uh, his life and some things biblically that we see that uh, uh, we see were uh, Ab Abraham stepping out in faith. Um, this just should be a little quick, uh, quick uh, deal here. I just wanted to talk about uh, his life. Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well. So we know the story of Abraham. Um, it opens with a profound, powerful event. <laughs> Excuse me. Abraham's response to God. More specifically, his response to uh, God's call to leave his home and uh, go to a land that God will show him. And uh, let me see if I can grab that. This will be in Genesis 12, 1. And it says, now the Lord has said unto Abram, get out, of, get out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land that I will show you. That's in 12.1. So the significant part is it launches uh, the great call in the life of Adam. So, Ab or excuse me, not Adam, uh, Abraham. Abraham uh, Abraham's following God's promise. It's uh, it's designed to help you respond like Abraham. So we want to talk about how do we respond similar to what Abraham did when God called him. And uh, just like uh, when he called him, God calls us in our lives. Um, whether you are a small devotional group leader, pastor, lay, lay person, deacon, uh, teacher, Sunday school teacher, or... Um, Anyone that um, has opportunities that God lays out in front of us. So we hope um, that, uh, so God, see, God moved deeply and revealed his story of redemption, and it, it began, with, began, began with the seed. Sorry, I have not enough coffee. Um, so indeed, the story continues. Uh, in our lives today, we can see this in our lives. Um, there's much to gain from this study, um, and I'm going to try to pull out a few things, uh, exegete um, some of the study uh, that people use in the Bible. Um, the resource, hopefully, is designed to retell, elaborate uh, these stories. So it's my prayer um, that you or your faith community or whoever uh, will be challenged and emboldened to the respond uh, to respond fully to God's uh, call for any particular reason, and hopefully this this study helps out. So um, we're going to read the passages from Genesis uh, chapter eleven, verse twenty seven, and we're going to go all the way to twenty uh, twelve nine. So let me read that narrative real quick, and we'll start at twenty seven. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Naor, and Haran, or Haran, and Haran began Lot, begat Lot, and Haran died before his father's father and Terah in the land of his nividity in Ur of the Chaldees. We'll talk about that, I hope. Uh, and Abram and Nahor took them wives. The names of the wives were Sarai. And the name of Naor's wife was Milkiah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milkiah, and the father of Iskeah. Just real quick, so to build credibility, you typically would lay out a foundation of your family um, and be able to explain the uh, the you know the uh, the lineage there uh, for credibility. So. Uh, so, verse 30, uh, but Sarai was barren. She had no child. 31, and Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot out of Haran, his own son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife, and they went forth with them to, uh, from Ur to the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came upon or unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years 
and Terra died in Haran. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit more about that. Chaldees is typically the uh, Babylonian, um, you know, kingdom or whatever. So let's look at um, chapter 12, verse 1. Now, the Lord said unto Abram, Get out of the con thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land I will show you. And I will make a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And then I will bless them that bless me or thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in these shall all families of the earth be blessed. So, verse 4 Abraham, Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. So, they're in Haran. His father's passed away, and now Lot and Abram are moving. Uh, Abram was 75 years of age when he departed Haran. And Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and his lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth into the went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. So Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem. Uh, unto the plain of Morai, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto thy seed, I will give you this land, and there build up he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So this would be, I believe, the second time that God's come to him, and he's building an altar. Typically what they do is they, uh, to symbolize, the uh, uh, situation where God came to him. And then verse 8 says, And he removed from thence unto a mountain of East Bethel, and pitched a tent, having Bethel on the west and Haye on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Verse 9, And Abram journeyed going on still, still towards the south. So, I'll, I'll stop there and just talk about a few things here. Um, my goal here is to understand the challenges that Abram faced as he stepped out, um, recognize uh, the nature of God's calling in, his, in Abram's life, and, and put a parody to our lives, and then understand how Abram's actions reflect his, his faith. So... As we delve in here, let me ask you this. What would you do if God came to you out of the blue? And he said, I need to, I need you to pick up, move, get your stuff together. I'll tell you where you go later. Imagine explaining that to your spouse, your wife, children, maybe your best friend. They would look at you like, what? You're crazy. And uh, they would probably protest. They'd probably try to talk you out of it. They'll do their best to do that. But yet God called Abram in exactly this way. We just read in 12 to, to, through uh, uh, chapter 12, verse 9. So let me just set the stage a little bit. Grab a coffee. So from, a, from, from um, let's see, from Adam and Eve, there's nine generations from Adam. Um, and uh, Noah being the last, um, basically we know that uh, God wiped out the earth at that point. But Noah, he had uh, a son, and his son named Shem um, is the chose is chosen to carry the godly seed. So the picture or the analogy here or the type of view of this is God, uh, the godly seed is the savior. Canaan would represent heaven. So again, that's more of an illustration. But when God call, uh, calls Abram for him to take his family out of the idolatry of Ur and travel to the promised land of Canaan. I, I want you to note this, though. Uh, scripture backs that up with Nehemiah uh, 9, 7, and 8. Let me uh, read that to you real quick. Nehemiah. Nine, I'm going to say nine, seven, and eight. 
you are. That's what I had. Yeah, 9, 7, and 8. So, verse 7, Thou art the Lord thy God, who didst choose Abraham, and brought him forth out of Ur, or the Chaldees, Babylon, and gavest him the name of Abraham, and foundest his heart faithful before thee, and madest a covenant with him to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the per Perizzites, um, and the Jebusites, and the Gigersites, to give it, I say, to, to his seed, and has performed thy words for thy righteousness. So basically, we see that right there in uh, uh, Nehemiah talks about it right there. So if you picked it up, there, I mean, there was, what, six tribes in Canaan, right? Um, I just named them. Um, and uh, look, we can look and see what Scripture tells us in, uh, in uh, Genesis 12.1. Uh, Abram and his family left uh, Ur and Chaldee's journey to Canaan uh, because God had confronted him and demanded his repentance and him to give him two promises, basically. The promise, again, I said earlier, Canaan, which would be symbolic to heaven. Were, were, and then my question for you is, um, do you know where Canaan is uh, in retrospect to uh, geology? Uh, 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 no, uh, as far as looking at from a map standpoint, um, that is uh, Canaan is considered Palestine, uh, the land of Israel. Um, so Canaan is represented as heaven, the promised seed of a great nation of descendants and the seed of one descendant, and particularly the Savior, as we know, as we talk through the gene uh, genealogy, that gives credibility all the way up. We start, we read that. Uh, both in uh, uh, Matthew and, and I think it's uh, Luke that gives the genealogy there. But it's, it's talking about Jesus Christ. Um, and there's two great promises here that should steer, could kind of arouse us a little bit about it or understand the great personal assurance and the security um, within the heart of Abraham. The great assurance and security of God himself. Every person, this is a thought, just think about this. Every person should do exactly what Abram did. Begin the journey of a great life. A great life is begun in seeking two, funda two fundamental things um, and, <clears throat> the two, uh, and saying two things that Abram, Abram sought. So number one, we, should, uh, we must seek the promised seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what we should do, and we should point others towards the promise, um, promise of Savior. Uh, number two, we should seek the promised land, which would be heaven. So those are two big uh, thoughts right there I want you to think about. Seeking the Lord, Jesus Christ, and in seeking our eternal life and glorifying God every single day. Um, so we see at the end of Genesis 11, uh, it introduces Abraham's family um, and provides a backstory of, of the events. So I'm not going to read the Bible verse again, but we initially see Adam as part of the uh, semi-nomadic clan. Simply means uh, a clan that's living, that is portable, temporary, that moves around. And it's led by his father, Terah. And the clan included Abraham's brother, Nahor, Haran, and Abraham's uh, nephew, Lot, Nahor's wife, Milcah. Abraham's wife, Sarah. Haran was the father of Lot. So that's his brother. Why am I mentioning this? Because this is important. Who was Lot, right? He was the nephew of Abraham who moved with uh, Abraham to the land of Canaan. Um, it's believed that Lot uh, trusted in God. He believed in him and he trusted him. However, Scripture is very clear um, that it was counted righteous uh, unto him of God, but he didn't live righteously. He was very selfish, and he was very carnal in the world. Aren't we like that? Even as Christians, we may know God, trust God, believe in God, but we do what Lot does. We essentially live a life of carnality. Um, so... <laughs> Genesis, again, we're talking 11, 27, so it introduces three key locations in this, uh, this, this uh, narrative. Ur of Chaldees um, 
So from Chaldees to Heron, it's about 600 miles. Um, and uh, Canaan, a uh, Abraham's uh, migration from the southern uh, Mesopotamia, which would be Ur, to Canaan that uh, was believed to be a foreshadow of the experience of Jesus, or excuse me, the Jews returning from Babylon, Babylon, Babylon from Exodus, Exodus, not enough coffee. May I ask a question? What was Abraham's father right with God? Was he a righteous man? We remember his father's name's Terah. But we see this in Josh 24, 2. And Joshua says, Unto all people, thus saith the Lord of God, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time. Even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, or Nachor, uh, and they served other gods, little g, plural. So he wasn't righteous, and he wasn't serving God. On the other side, you notice how the Bible says the other side of the flood in old time. So this is before the flood. Um, we're talking about that. So Ur um, of Chaldees was a city that was basically located about 120 to 140 miles from south of Babylon which I told you uh, Chaldees is Babylon, right above the Persian Gulf in a land called uh, the southern Mes Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. I have been to that area, and I've actually, uh, we, I served there, um, and our unit was there. Um, of course, I had no idea what it was at the time, and here, here we are 30 years later, I'm studying it. But, but what you need to know about Ur, uh, which is kind of interesting, discovers, um, archaeologists discovered um, remains of the city um they, they excavated and they showed that the city was cultured and educated uh with the latest mathematic tables now uh, they had dictionaries you know books or whatever or, or parchment whatever they used uh, the city was uh architecture with the very finest building so it was a very um in that time the new the new york city of the time every you know everything was there the city was also very idolatry centric uh, with a large temple that worshiped the moon god the moon god his name was ur naming after the city so note the city took the, the name moon god ur uh, which is an idol so this is so it, it was a it was a non-righteous it was a sinful uh idol worshiping uh city and god's pulling him out of that pulling abram out of so we can we can look at a couple of things for thought for for, for, thoughts, for strong lessons here. We can draw on the fact that that uh, Heron, um, uh, number one, a parent um, can have an evil influence upon his be on his children because or he's living in a in an ungodly city. The parents can influence their children in evil. Number two, the parent can influence, um, can have good influence. You can have evil and you can have good on the children. But God commands all parents to set a godly example before our children. Um, very important that uh, as as godly, as we're, we're stewards of what, um, God gives us, and our children are are given to us by God to raise them in 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 the good influence, um, uh, you know about how a family, the nucleus, and the patriarch or the father of the family, we're given that uh, authority, uh, but we are stewards of that um, of our children and everything we own. We own nothing; simply own nothing. Everything belongs to God. You say, "Well, whoa, chaplain." I get up every day. I work hard for what I got. Okay. Who gave you the power to work? I'm not trying to shoot holes in you, but you know, let's be honest. Where where did you get the power to get up that morning to go to work? It had to come from where? It came from God. So God, we learned, God clearly called Abram from a familiar, unknown um, area without explaining where he was going to go. He had no idea. He's calling him to this place. He does not know anything about it. 
and that he gives them the promise of a great nation. Um, the lack of detail in God's uh, instruction for Abraham to go to the land that I will show you indicates what? Faith. The, fa the fact that he packs up, takes his family, and he goes somewhere where he's never been before because God has come to him and told him that's what he wants him to do, and Abraham steps out in faith. We also know that uh, he, he was faithful about uh, Sarai, his wife, um, who's going to be pregnant now he's, or have a son, Isaac. But uh, Sarai, um, she, you know, she, she basically laughed. But he's in, he's in uh, Haran, um, and he's, he, when he gets to the promised land, he's leaving Haran at 75. So, um, so have you ever, ever felt torn between what you felt God was calling you to do, what others expected you to do, and how would you respond to that? So think about that. Have you ever felt like that? What types of pressure did you receive you 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 uh did you face in that situation as you recall uh, those who questioned your call? You ever did anything that somebody said, well that's not you know, we shouldn't do that wife, family, father, figure, mom, or whoever, uh, have you ever found yourself trying to talk to other people out of what they thought is what God wanted for them? You know, those are things we need to reflect on um, in our own lives and rely on God for everything. So you, basically, I, talked, I just talked about being torn. Um, I talked about the pressures that you typically you faced. Um, how did Abram's honor? How did Abram honor God with outward acts of reflected in his inward faith? So his honor was with an outward act that reflected what he believed on the inside by following what God tells him to do. So, in what ways could you outwardly and physically respond to God in worship. You let's talk about it. Go to church, read your Bible. You can have uh, devotions. You can have prayer time. You can attend uh, church of uh, like uh, likeness of faith of other individuals, not forsaking um, the church and the assembly. Um, you can um, you can tithe. You can, uh, you know, support missions. Uh, you know, we have a building fund going on. Um, extracurricular stuff, food banks, uh, first responders, meals. Um, you know, we have a widow's group. We have uh, young at heart ministry. I think of myself there. Um, you know, there's uh, uh, many ways. Just, just sharing God sharing the gospel because of what you believe inside. So consider, consider the energy which had to be invested in building the al altar of offering sac excuse me, sacri sacrifice of worship. How did he honor God? His outward act ref reflected again. He does this altar, which is part of a memorial of the situation or the time for remembrance. So you pass that down to your family um, and people, and they learn that. So let's consider a couple things. So um, while worshiping today doesn't always require a physical effort on our part, but it could, right? I just named a few. In what ways could you and, phys and physically respond to God in worship, right? What could you do? Think about share. I, I think of the gospel, the great, the good news of of Christ with people that are without. Um, there's one way physically you can take that message um, to people. So you you know he's called out. Abraham's faithful response to God influenced um, the efforts of latter. Biblical writers, as they too struggle with balance of being faithful, faithful obedience to God, and 
with the fear of the unknown. Fear is always anxiety, fear that kind of go together. Generations of Abraham, his descendants, the Israelites, faced the daunting uh, prospect of the journey uh, from Mesopotamia back to the promised land, the return of the Babylon uh, exile. Uh, the prophets encourage Israelites to um, remind themselves that God's faithfulness to Abraham, especially since the journey resembled his course um, from Ur to, to Canaan. And I want to support that with, uh, let's go to Micah chapter 7, still in the Old Testament. 7, I think it's 7 and 8. Let me look. Uh, 19, I'm sorry. 19, I believe 20. Let me capture that. All right, so in Micah chapter 7, verse 19, and he will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. He will He will cast out the sins in the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy of Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto the fathers from the days of old. So essentially, um, we learn uh, just right there, um, it's still talked about in Micah. Um, Isaiah, let's, let's look at my Isaiah 51 too. Isaiah 51 two. let me find it for us. Uh, Isaiah 51 two. That's a great book of Isaiah, one and two. The great prophet says, Hearken to me, or hear to me, ye that follows after righteousness, and you seek, ye seek the Lord, that ye seek the Lord. Look upon the rock whence he, ye are hewn, and the hole of the pit where whence ye were digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear, that bear you, for I, I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. You know, so Isaiah is even talking about his faithfulness, and he's talking about the call to uh, to Abraham. Um, you know, Hebrews Hebrews eleven eight is another great uh, verse. Let me pull that one up. This is in the New Testament. Uh, Hebrews eleven eight. I'll read that to you guys real quick. That way. Um, and the Bible says, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into the place which he should receive an, for an inheritance, which is Canaan, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing what, uh, whether he went. And then basically says, by faith he sojourned, that's faith, sojourned in the land, travel to, uh, the land of promise, Canaan, as in a strange company, dwelling to, in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, and the heirs which with him are the same promise. Um, and he looked for the city, which he had foundations, that the builder and the maker of God. You know, so, you know, another great example right there in Hebrews that's uh, calling it out. And um, Abraham, when he was called, he obeyed, right? Um, so we even see this in the New Testament. Acts talks about it in 7 too. Um, just the obedience of Abraham. Um, and God's constant source of reassurance. That reassurance is for us too. That's not, I'm not just narrating a story here um, or reading anything. I'm, I'm saying, how is it, how's it applicable to us? Well, we should have, if we're, we're faithful, we should have the reassurance. Just as uh, Abraham journeyed, um, he served to reassure the Israelites returning from exile. Uh, this is later, but... Um, you know, when they're driven out and they've captured Jerusalem. And, you know, we see that later in uh, uh, the Old Testament, how uh, I believe Ezra and stuff, they came back. Uh, his actions served as a model. It was uh, an exemplary faith uh, and trust in God for early church. Um, so if we discuss the difference that Abraham depicted in the Gospels, um, we could read Matthew 3, 7 through 10. We can uh, read John 8, 39 through 40, and John 8, 56 through 59. And we'll, I'm not going to read all those. Um, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to read all that for, for time's sake. Uh, but I, I call those out for you guys to see. So 
Um, does the Bible emphasize on God's past faithfulness encourage you or frustrate you? His promise to you, does that encourage you or are you frustrated by it? What Bible verses or hymns or praise songs can you use or renew your faith in times of struggle? Everybody has like a, 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 a truth verse um, that they use in a time of trouble. Um, you know, sometimes when I'm in, in, in um, I don't know, disarray, you know, I may say something like, uh, get hence behind me, Satan, like Jesus told, um, he told Peter. And he told he, uh, Satan that she shall not tempt the Lord. Um, you know, I, I, this morning, I had a, a verse this morning in James. And uh, for as many things were offended, Paul, and James is talking about the tongue. If any man offend not in word is the same in perfection, which he's talking about righteousness. Um, in other words, your tongue is not righteousness as able to bridle the whole body. So basically talking about a mature Christian uh, that holds his tongue um, is a sign of maturity in an individual. So that was this morning. I just kind of reflected on that as I was, uh, you know, getting up and going this morning. So, so we talk about the disconnected. Is it easy to feel disconnected from or I would say it's easy to feel disconnected from people, uh, from people in God uh, that work through the Bible times. Does the, the Bible emphasize God's faithfulness and courage? Well, we know it does. Um, so we need to have those those uh, those those verses, those songs, and things that can help us. Um, you know what was so special about Abraham? Why did God choose him? Okay. Some of the ancient Jewish answers are Abraham was strong as a bean. Abraham rejected idolatry. Abraham chose God first. Um, we could see that. And uh, Abraham led, uh, he led uh, God to choose him instead of someone else. We may see or have wonder the same things when we think about someone in our ministry or our leadership. Um, why is he or she called? rather than someone else. Why is this person so special? And those are some of the unanswered questions, but this is an example through Abraham, how he was chosen and, and selected. Uh, the idea uh, of God um, that called Abraham was simply he wanted to, apart from Abraham's merit. It was unmerited favor when he selected. It's unfathomable to the Jewish readers of the Bible. Um, ancient Jewish readers focus on Abraham's righteousness, not on God's faithfulness. That's where the law came in, and they felt they could follow the law that would get them to where they wanted to go, and they didn't focus on what God provided for them, and that was faithfulness. Uh, so before God choose, uh, before God chose Abram, and Abraham worshipped the true God. Um, remember, he came from a very ungodly city, Earth. So have you ever compared yourself uh, to see? or seem to have an ideal faith? Um, are you compared yourself? Uh, what kind of, what can you do to maintain the balance of appreciating those that God put in our lives to learn from what, while not losing sight of his hand in all things? People come into our lives and people come out of our lives, go in our lives. Um, people are um, with us for a season. Uh, some for a lifetime, but God, you are exactly where God wants you to be today. Um, there's nothing you, he knows everything long before we even think it. So we're exactly where we need to be. And how do we appreciate the people that come in our lives and look at it from, how do you know, God put this person in my life and we're having, you know, whatever it is, the advice or communication, which is friendship. Have you ever struggled uh, to accept um, to accept God's grace. Did you find it hard to believe that he loves you and accepts you as you are? How have you learned to trust God's love for you? We can never lose sight of that, folks. God loves us. And his people, 
And he wants a what? A relationship. He wants you to love him, right? With all your mind, soul, heart, body, and strength and everything. And then the second is your neighbor like you love yourself. There's a two of the, uh, the, the mainstay um, examples or commandments. So what do we miss? Um, we sometimes will miss what God is doing today or will do tomorrow by focusing on past reactions. One of the old cliches I used to say is best prediction of future behavior is past performance. Um, sometimes we focus on that too much. Uh, somebody said to me once, there's three days of the week you need to focus on or you need to be worried about. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Or one day a week is today. Don't worry about tomorrow and don't worry about uh, yesterday. One day a week is the day you're at. And that's true. Um, God continues to do work in us um, because of his merit. He's doing it because he loves us. We can learn a lot about um, faithful, uh, watching the faithfulness, but there's a risk, right? Have you ever found that you compare yourself to other believers and perhaps idolize those who seem to have an ideal faith? Have you ever seen somebody that just so, you just, you think they're so righteous and pious and uh, godly and they give a great example of walking in their life? I could name a thousand people. I never think for myself for one moment that I am better or I'm a religious person person more or I believe in God more than you and all that each and every one of us bear our own cross but you can't help sometimes to listen to a great message and say wow what a man of God I like you know um, a Billy Graham I love listening to you know little small clips of what he he preached and uh, what a faithful man right so we have people that we're enamored by right we have people that just uh capture us and they 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 help us they help us in um, any distractions we have about serving or understanding the word or whatever and uh, um, you know so we all have those right so um, we learn about a lot about faith but there's a risk if we compare ourselves we're perhaps idolizing those who seem to have idle faith which we don't want to do so what can we do? We need to maintain a balance. We need to appreciate those that God has put in our lives. Uh, we're not uh, learn from while not losing sight of his hand in all things. Good or bad? Job talked about the good and bad. What was it? Um, what was it 16 times or something like that? I, I can't remember. Eight times or something. Um, he asked God why. It was either eight or sixteen? I can't remember. But uh, even even Job, why are you? You know, why God? What you know? Why is this happening? Perhaps is there good? Is there not? Um, is there not evil with good? Is everything always good or evil? Um, you have to continue to keep in context and lose sight of God in all things. Sometimes we uh, we struggle with God's grace. Um, have you found it? Uh, it's hard to believe that he loves us or accepts us. Certainly there's times in my life I don't think the Lord looks at me and knows that I'm glorifying. And how, how do I learn to trust in God, uh, his love for me? And that's, that's, that's faith. That's, that's Abraham's faith. Um, so have you ever uh, hesitated when you felt called to step out in faith? Well, my God keep trying to draw you out of something? new and unknown think about a time when you felt you had to step out in faith a thing started to take a wrong turn you ever been there how did you react did you try to hang on to what you thought god promised so let's think about some, some things here i just want to talk through this and this will uh, kind of close it up a little bit as i as the pastor says bring it in for landing we all resist God's nudge, nudges at some point, right? We fight within our own comfort zones. Um, 
I think of, uh, I listened to the spiritual leadership uh, message that was given by Don Sisk, 70 years serving God as a preacher, started in 1954, I think he said it was. Um, he said he said he, when he went up to the altar and said God called him to be a minister. And the minister said, you know, he's up at the altar. He said, okay, well, you're going to preach on Wednesday. And he's like, well, I didn't think it was going to be that fast. But he asked him. He said, how are you saved? And he said, by the grace of God. And he said, you'll use that same grace of God when you preach and put your faith and trust in him. I think of that. It was like the, one of the first messages of their spiritual uh, conferences out there. So. Um, coming out of our comfort zones. Have you ever caught yourself intentionally holding back when you feel like you're called to step out? What do you think when God keeps trying to draw you towards something, a new and unknown, and you feel compelled or you feel convicted? So think about a time when you felt you had to step out, but things continued to go wrong. Did you try to hang out, hang on to what you thought God had promised, opposed to what his promise is? So God is powerful enough to ensure that his promises are fulfilled. But Abram's fear and doubts help us reflect on our own relationship to God's call and promise, this message. When we get caught up in what we think we need to do for God, in order to be worthy of his promise, we may lose sight um, of, the th of other things we truly need to do. We need to trust his promise. We need to accept his call and surrender our doubts and fears and insecurities to God. May God help us. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. And 